featuring the uh, third part of my interview with Mark Soderwall. And believe me, guys, this is not an episode you're going to want to miss. As you uh, probably know, uh, Mark I got to work with Arnold Schwarzenegger on the game uh, Terminator 3. And he talks about that, and there's a lot of great stories there. I know you're going to enjoy that. Uh, he also got to work with the Wachowski brothers on the Matrix game, and uh, we get to hear about that and what the Wachowski brothers are like. In other words, this is really fascinating stuff, and I know you're going to enjoy it. Uh, so without further ado, here is Mr. Mark Soderwall. You also worked on uh, Magic Candle 3. Yeah. In 1990. Now, this is a series, you know, I've heard a lot about it. It was a, you know, a little bit, I, I somehow missed it, you know, when it was new. Uh, but I know a lot of people are big fans of this uh, series, and it's actually some calls to, br to bring it back. So uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Magic Candle 3? And, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier, and you said that there was a lot of problems with the publisher on this game, and there was a uh, feature creep that kept hacking on. Uh, more and more stuff to the production cycle. So can you just sort of tell the story of what was going on with uh, Magic Candle 3? Well, it started out with a really great design and a really great story. And we had a, you know, a number of solid, you know, um, antagonists and protagonist type of characters. Um, and then as, you know, we started to develop the game, we started to find out, oh goodness, you know, we're, we're breaking into, you know, some, some new breakthroughs by way of technology and some tools that are allowing us to realize other types of features if we want to wander a bit. And so next thing you know, we started to feature creep. We started to explore new NPC characters to where it started to become fairly convoluted um, a little bit. And we kind of lost, lost our way um, because we just started going off on all these little... Uh, vacuum oriented types of uh, side quests and designs and, and characters to where you started to lose the the foundation and uh, coupled with that is our memory footprint started to get a little out of control by way of just the the size that it was starting to take up um, you know on the discs and different things like that and then we started you know the publishers were starting to get worried about you know how many floppy disks, I said floppy disks, um, five and a quarter inch disks is this, you know, game going to be on because this is costing us money, you know. You say you got up to 16 disks at one point. Yeah, I mean, it was just ridiculous, <laughs> you know. And, and then, of course, you know, the more disks you get and the more, uh, you know, the more depth and immersion in the story, the more time it costs by way of QA. You know, somebody's got to vet this stuff. So, I mean, somebody's got to play through this game. And when you have so many different NPCs and so many quests and you have to talk to so many people and grab artifacts and march all the way to the other side of the map and drop this off, grab this, march it back, find keys to the... It just gets nuts, right? And, I mean, that's why I have such a, a high respect for designers like Chris Avalon, um, you know, that do these amazing RPG games like Fallout, you know, and, and, and New Vegas and different things like that. Because these guys, I don't know how they track this stuff. They're just brilliant. But anyways, I digress. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of it was was going back to Design Doc originally, looking at those first few pages and saying, okay, what was the story? <laughs> Who are the main characters? What are we trying to achieve? There's got to be a beginning, middle, and end. Um, you know, and we've got to be able to find a way to, you know, achieve this in a certain amount of discs so that the user isn't spending three hours loading this game, uh, potentially breaking something, putting the wrong disk in, uh, customer sh support from the publisher side is going to get overloaded, or from the developer side, because there's going to be tons of questions, people losing their way, people can't find this. and So these are all the back-end things that you need to start to answer early on in design. You know, It's not enough just to have a lot of story, a lot of NPCs, and a lot of creativity. That's all great. But... What's it going to cost you on the back end by some of the things I just mentioned? So, you know, again, you, you've got to ask the hard questions and not be ignorant to it. I've got another question here from, from Twitter. This is from a, a viewer named Pulver Congan. I hope I have that uh, name pronounced right. But he, he, you know, I know you've worked on all these movie-to-game projects. We talked about Terminator, Star Wars, uh, Force yeah. Unleashed, Matrix, Indiana Jones. I mean, you're the guy to ask this question. <laughs> Uh, so the question is, uh, what's it like uh, to, to work on one of these movie tie-in games, uh, knowing that the uh, uh, the way he's got this phrased here is, uh, let me just read his question. <laughs> okay. What's it like to know you're making a movie tie-in game that's likely to be butchered in the media? Uh, parentheses, movie tie-ins usually aren't well-received. Yeah, no, so 
I don't know if that's what you think about that uh, issue, but uh, in any case, I'm curious, you know, what's the difference between working on a game that's based on a movie uh, versus uh, one with an original universe? Well, obviously, we've seen games based on a movie, and, and unfortunately, I've worked on a few of those. Ugh, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, then, of course, you see, um, you know, games that... Uh, aren't necessarily based on a movie, although they have shades of it, or based on a comic book like Batman Arkham, you know, um, <laughs> amazing game, all right? I mean, that game's so full of mood and mechanics and features that I could talk for an hour on that game alone of just what they did right. I'd have to find something, you know, I'd have to dig in to find something they did wrong, and even then I'd probably be reaching a bit. But movie to game titles are really, really difficult because of the fact that a lot of it is driven by marketing, you know, and I, I hate to throw marketing under the bus, but, uh, you know, marketing is, is expensive. I mean, you can make a great game, but, you know, grassroots will only really get you so far, um, and you want to, especially if a movie's coming out and it's got some big names in it, like, uh, you, know, um, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, or, you know, um, <laughs> they're all escaping me right now, but... Uh, <laughs> But I'm, the thing is, is that a lot of the game publishers want to try and capitalize and release with day and date with the movie as much as possible because the hype is there. You know, you've got the movie studios and their production budgets that have got billboards all over bus stops and, and freeway, you know, billboards. And they've got TV ads running and, and different things like that. And then usually at the very end of a TV ad for a movie or something like that, a trailer, it shows, you know, the little graphic that says available on PS3 or, or something like that. And so we're racing against the clock. And the big misnomer concerning movie production to games is the fact that movies can be edited and reshot on the fly. You know, and so, and a lot of times because movies are so, uh, are so secretive in a sense of their scripts and their screenplays and their stories, uh, whereas you think, well, you know, we're working on Terminator 3, so you'd think that we'd have access, you know, to the Terminator 3, you know, script and screenplay. Not so. We actually had to travel, which was actually convenient because the movie production studio Synergy was right next door to Atari in Santa Monica. But we'd have to go there. We'd have to ask permission. We'd have to schedule time to sit down and look through this big Bible of the screenplay. We weren't able to take notes. Well, we were up to some degree. We weren't able to take pictures. We couldn't. We couldn't take any of that with us back to the studio because it was all under lock and key. So we had to try and retain as much as we could, and then not get distracted walking back to the studio. So we remembered everything, and then try and write it down as fast as possible so we can implement this scene into the game or whatever. Only to find out three months later, as we go back through the script or the screenplay, to find out, hey, where did those pages go? Oh, well, we dropped that from the movie. We're not going to do that anymore. We're like, dear Lord Jesus, you know, we've had, we've had a crew of, you know, 20 people working on this environment for the past month. Now you're telling us that that's just completely all shot to bunk and, and you know, now we're stuck? And um, so it, it was frustrations like that. And, and so that's why you don't see a, a real hyper innovation in uh, movie to games um, because – Again, we had to keep things very safe. Um, we had to keep things very loose because, like I just pointed out, they could change on the fly. And so you didn't really want to go too deep into any one thing on the off chance that it might, you know, get thrown out and all of a sudden, or, you know, we'd push the time date out or we'd miss the window. And if that were the case, we'd all get fired, you know. And so um, it was really this, you know, movie to game titles is all about survival mode. To be quite honest, but uh, now at least that's my experience. I'm sure others would have different experiences, but I don't think I'm far off. <laughs> yeah, that sounds totally hellish. Is the only word that <laughs> comes to mind. Yeah. I mean, yeah. does the gaming media? Do you? Is the you know game magazines and such? Do they tend to be prejudiced towards uh, uh, these movie tie-in games before they even see it? Well, I think so, um, because we just have such a legacy of just crappy movie to games out there. You know, it's just like, it's it's almost like everybody just kind of just chuckling under their breath when it's just like, oh, Green Lantern's coming out. Oh, it's a movie that's got all these great effects. Oh, they're going to be doing a game. It's like, oh, <laughs> it's like, oh, who's the, 
Who's the yeah. poor studio that's going to be doing that? That's just going to get thrown under the bus again, you know, and whatever. But the thing is, is, is one of the nice things about working on The Matrix was the fact that the Wachowski brothers actually wrote um, a brand new story for the game. It was a backstory that dealt with, uh, you know, um, Niobe and Ghost, you know, and uh, the Osiris. And it was really cool because whereas the movie, The Matrix, had this timeline that was, you know, it was linear, the nice thing is is that the way the Drachowski brothers wrote the game was that, you know, here's the time, here's the, here's the linear, and so our game would start here, and then it would kind of have a story that would intersect with the movie, and then it would go off into its own experience, and then come back a little further in with the movie, and so, so you always had this nice, comfortable tie-in and aha moments to where it's like, oh, that's how it, that's how it fell into play in a linear timeline with the movie, and then all of a sudden, oh, cool, now we're kind of going off and expanding another part of the universe, another part of the story. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate uh, movie to game titles that do stuff like that, so you're not just so uh, railed to a linear experience of trying to make a movie from end to end as a game, because just from a, from a philosophical standpoint, a movie is a passive experience, a game is a non-linear interactive experience. They're, they're, they fly in the face of each other, right? So you've got to be able to build towards those individual uh, identities, those, those mechanics. And, uh, you know, we're still learning. We're still learning how to do that. I, mean, I think the Wachowski brothers have the right idea. I mean, that sounds, that well, sounds brilliant. Games. I don't know why every, every movie in the game should be like that. Yeah, I mean, the Wachowski brothers, I mean, they're just big kids. You know, they're like us. I, they, you know, they've got figurines all over their desks, and, you know, they drink Red Bull and eat pizza, and, and you know, they're just, they're just big kids, and they love to have fun. They watch kung fu movies. They, you know, they read comic books. They play video games, and so it's just like, that's why, you know, those movies were so spectacular because it appealed to to a generation, a, a niche generation, so to speak, but they did it in such a, a great way that it made it a mass appeal as well. So everybody was satisfied. It, it, was, it was brilliant. They're, just, they're very creative people. Very creative. Right, so before we move on, though, I really want to know, so, so what's the deal with the Arnold Schwarzenegger? <laughs> His eyes are too far apart. What, what was this? No, it was really interesting because uh, when we were constructing Arnold, we actually had um, cyber scan data, you know, where they, they basically, you know, laser scanned his body while he was in underwear and, and whatever. And, uh, you know, so we had good uh, topology type of information concerning his structure and, and different things like that, that, uh, you know, even though that was a very high polygon, high frequency type of map that was... Uh, put out of, of his body and all the contours and different things like that, we had to really dummy it down, obviously, for the game, uh, just so it could fit within memory so the game wasn't running at two frames a second. Um, and the, the thing was is that we found that as we started to interpolate down the polygons, you know, certain things would start to mess up or break, or whatever, and so we had to reconstruct uh, part of his body, and so... Um, you know, and then once we got it back to a likeness that we felt was pretty one to one, given the limitations, um, it would get in the game, and I would just sit there and I'd be like, you know what, that just—it's a Terminator, right? It, it needs to have—it needs to have, um, you know, this this larger than life appeal to it. And so, long story short, concerning uh, concerning Arnold Schwarzenegger was the fact that uh, we, you know, we had cyber scan of his of his body, which was actually 3D information um, taken from his actual, you know, the topology and the contours of his frame. And we brought that into the computer, and we we did some, you know, massaging and 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 kind of winnowing it down in order to make it game ready, um, and so on and so forth. But we had to get approval on it. Um, and the funny thing was, is but before we got approval on it, I noticed it running around in game, and I'm just like, boy, this just doesn't look Schwarzenegger enough. This just doesn't look Terminator enough. Make his thighs bigger, broaden his shoulders, make his chest, you know, wider, um, you know, and different things like that. His face was okay, but I just, again, I really wanted to give him kind of the Hulk smash, you know, kind of a kind of a look. And you know, even though Schwarzenegger is a big guy, transfer, you know taking his information of his body and trying to put that in game, just, believe it or not, there just wasn't enough exaggeration there in order to make it, you know, seem Terminator-ish. So I, I made a call 
a, a, a visual call. And so basically we went back and uh, Schwarzenegger came to Synergy uh, Studios, which was next door to Atari, and we sat down and his agent was there and, and different things like that. And his agent really had a hard time, you know, with with the changes that were made to the model. It's just like, ah, well, you know, I, don't, I think his eyes, you know, are too close or too far apart or whatever, or his nose is too wide. And, and Arnold was sitting there, he's like, no, no, I, it's fine. It's fine. I look okay, you know, and whatever. And the, the agent would say something else, you know, it's like, oh, he seems kind of short and stocky or, or whatever. And Arnold would be like, no, it's okay. You know, I, I like the way it looks. It's fine. And, and it was really funny because this, this agent was just a real tool. I just man he just had so many different things to say and i understand it's his job you know he's trying to protect his brand and you know and schwarzenegger and, and you know but you know if if arnold had something to say knowing his reputation he'd just say it right probably laced with an f-bomb or something like that he's like the, it's like the samuel l jackson of like the the muscle clad uh group but um you know and so the only the, the funny thing was is the only thing schwarzenegger really had to say concerning his likeness was he's just like uh could you make my chest a little bigger you know can you can you make it look more more menacing more imposing and, and everything like that and i didn't have the heart to tell him that we already did you know it's just like well we already <laughs> we already exaggerated that for you but you know <laughs> if you want it more fine you know we'll go ahead and make it more but so it was uh that was a lot of fun it, it was you know so it's just uh that was back when, you know, Arnie was running for governor and, you know, and, and all that stuff. And so he, he really didn't, he really didn't care too much about the details because he had, he had other priorities. And so he was just kind of like, you know, I just, all right, it looks great. Can I just get out of here, please? <laughs> um, but, you know, it was a great experience. Um, rarely when we do movie to game type stuff, do we have interaction with the actual uh, actors. But, you know, the whole marketing hook of this Terminator 3 game was for the first time ever we have Arnold Schwarzenegger's likeness in the game you know it's like we actually got rights to his license and his likeness so that was a big hook so um, you know marketing loved that so anytime there was Arnold Schwarzenegger was on the set or talking with Atari or anything like that cameras were there everybody was documenting everything because it was all PR and publicity right so yeah that's awesome he's one of my my favorite actors it must have been great <laughs> you know, it's funny too. Another one of my uh, favorite actors is, of course, uh, Patrick Stewart. I don't know if you, you know, he he did some work in uh, one another one of your games, The Forgotten Realms, Demon Stone. So I don't know if you had any interaction uh, with him or not. But I'm just sort of curious what you think about Demon Stone. Uh, Demon Stone was great. Um, working with uh, Ari Salvatore, um, great author that did the, uh, you know, the, the Drizzt Dewar and the Dark Elf trilogies, which was a fantastic trilogy. Um, it was just, is awesome. I mean, his writing style was, was great. Um, you know, uh, personally, it was really funny because I, <laughs> you know, given the premise of, of Demon Stone, you know, which was uh, a fairly innovative game in and of itself, it, you know, it was built on the Two Towers game engine. Um, by Stormfront Studios then, and uh, great talent, great group of people to work with. Don Dagger and his group were just amazing. Um, but it just seemed, it seemed like a, a little bit of overkill by way of, you know, story to, you know, it seemed like it, would, it should have been a heavy RPG, you know, and not just this, this third-person action-adventure, you know, uh, type of experience that's just my personal opinion you know it's just like you got this guy Salvatore who's written this amazing trilogy and some fantastic author that could just realize worlds you know with words you know and we're this is kind of what we're doing with it it's like really you know it's like kind of putting a Ferrari engine in a Pinto you know or, or something like that so um, that's not to take away from the game you know and, and so hear my heart when I say that I just uh, you know the game was a fantastic execution it really was. Like I said, I worked with a lot of talented people. Um, I wish I could take a lot of credit for what went in there. Um, I didn't. It was a very collaborative effort. Um, it was actually one of the easier projects to work on, to be quite honest, because everybody was so talented. Um, you know, it was just a lot of nodding, just saying, yeah, that's, that's approved. That looks great. You know, fantastic. Oh, I've got this idea. Okay, that's wonderful. Awesome. Just don't break anything and run with it, you know. Um, so... Yeah, but there was, like I said, when you've got a lot of good, talented people, um, you know, it, it makes things easier. But, you know, you, you do still have to watch out for the feature creeping, like we talked about, because, uh, 
you know, everybody wants to throw in their idea, and they're all good ideas, and, um, but eventually, at the end of the day, the game's got to get made, you know, and things have got to get cut. So it's, it's, really, it's really disheartening sometimes, because you, when a game gets published and put out, because you knew it could have been so much more. Uh, you know, and had this that much more depth to it, or, or character realization, or mechanic. Um, but you know, that's why you do another version of the game. <laughs> that's why you do the second version. <laughs> yeah, I'm really, really feeling your pain here with this. I know a lot of people are too, because you've got the the old school tabletop uh, D and D background, mm -hmm. right? So you, yeah. I mean, you must uh, not like a lot of this simplification that's going on in some of these. Those yeah, models. you know, but you just, you know, it is what it is, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, as, as much as I'd, I'd like to consider myself an artist and a fine artist at that, um, I'm a commercial artist, you know, and I, I hate to sound so, you know, um, insensitive, but, you know, it's it's a job, and, you know, I, I want to try and realize as much as I can in the job that I do, but at the end of the day, it, it is a business, right? I mean, it's just a, it's a sad fact but in order for me to continue doing what I love, I've got to produce product. You know, I have to make sure that the that the developer is getting money, um, that I'm getting money, so I can keep my icebox full. The developer can keep buying new machines and software. The publishers are staying happy, so they can give the developer bags of money. Um, you know, so it it is a business. It's the art of business, I guess you might say. You always had another question from Polverb that is about this. You know, do you notice this? Is this a problem? Uh, the sort of focus on uh, the bottom line is that is that something that's been consistent throughout your career, or, or have you noticed it uh, becoming increasingly important as time no, is going on? It's, it's increasingly important as time goes on, especially in this economy and this season that we're in right now. Um, the last two years really have been very trying for the industry, where we've actually found that we can bleed. Um, whereas the industry has predominantly been recession proof, um, that's even a term, but you know, gaming is a, for the most part, a cheap form of entertainment when you, when you consider, you know, how much movies cost and, you know, popcorn and going out to dinner and different things like that, which is, which are great experiences and they're well and fine. Some are passive, some are interactive, but you know, it's like you could spend 40 or $60 on a game and get, you know, 20 hours of experience, you know, and then if there's an online component or a multiplayer component or a co-op component, oh, it just, you know, exponentially increases from there, uh, especially if it's got user-generated content and tools and, and mapping tools and game-building tools. It's like, geez, sky's the limit, as opposed to paying, you know, $20 or, you know, a couple of times to go see a, a really great movie, um, you know, and so... But at the same time, for some reason, this this economy, this world global economy, and, and this recession, so to speak, or you know whatever, has really hit the gaming industry. I've had a lot of friends and a lot of colleagues um, getting getting laid off, um, you know, from large studios, THQ and, and Lucas, and uh, you know Disney, and, and uh, you know so on and so forth. So it's really a, it's really disheartening. Um, but, you know, therein lies, you know, a lot of the innovation because these people do get laid off and they're so talented um, that they do start creating their own indie games, right? And they do start utilizing a lot of these tools that are out there and available because they don't have the resources of the studio anymore um, that they're having to go in and start fishing now, you know, for, for what's available to everybody. But because they have the experience and because they have the passion and they have knowledge, they're able to create things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to realize actually at a studio because there's so much politics and there's, there's money involved. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, really do because I need your help. As uh, you probably know, I've been doing a match hat now for two years 
And it's, of course, a lot of fun, but there's a hell of a lot of work that goes into these episodes. I estimate that I spend anywhere from 10 to 16 hours on a single episode. Uh, that's, of course, factoring in the time it takes to find people to interview, to do the interview, to, to get the footage, to edit it all down, to, uh, to render it. And uh, a lot of times I'll spend all day just finding uh, the games that I want to show and uh, getting them set up uh, properly to, uh, to run and then to get the footage. I mean, this is a, a lot of work that goes into, the, into these. Uh, so if you've donated to the show, uh, that's uh, really nice, and I really appreciate that. It does a lot to uh, lift my spirits, but also need to try to get the word out uh, because, uh, you know, I didn't make my uh, 7,000 uh, subscriber goal for the end of the year, uh, far from it. You know, as a matter of fact, my uh, views and such have uh, actually started to go down. Uh, so I really need uh, you to help. If you've got a forum uh, that you frequent, a blog, Twitter, uh, Facebook, I know you guys have something like that. So if you'll just take a minute to post there about uh, this episode or one of your favorite episodes and you know try to help me grow uh, the audience for this because I really do think that uh, people like Mark uh, Sorter, well, they deserve an audience. Uh, they deserve to hear people uh, hear their views and hear their thoughts. And, you know, they've taken the time to, uh, to do these interviews and it's kind of up to us uh, to get the word out about them. So. Anyway, guys, whatever you can do, I will personally be very grateful to you, and thank you very much. Um, now, about that ale of the week. <laughs> uh, my favorite part of the show. All right, so I have a Matilda Belgian-style ale. Now, if you, uh, me personally, I love Belgians. I, every time I see the word Belgian on <laughs> a beer, I have an instant need to try it out. I just really like it. One day I will go to Belgium, now, I think that's probably about as close to heaven as I'll ever get in this lifetime. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, brewed by Goose Island. You've probably seen their Honkers, Honkers Ale. That's uh, a pretty, pretty common uh, site. Uh, it's brewed in Chicago, and I think it's got maybe a 7% um, alcohol. Now, they suggest that you serve it in uh, <laughs> some kind of a little glass like that. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, that's what I've got my horn here for. I've already poured a little bit of this in. Uh, now this, it definitely smells like a Belgian, you know, if you've had maybe a, a Chimay uh, or the, uh, that line, you know, it's, you know, very similar, very nice smell, not, not alcoholic or anything like that. Maybe a little, uh, cherry, you know, I, I'm not really good at describing smells. <laughs> you had to go to school for that, right? So anyway, let's just see if it tastes good. Uh, very good taste. It's very smooth. Not that sort of fiery uh, alcohol that you get with some of these uh, special brews. Very, uh, a lot of flavors going on right now. This is <laughs> pretty intense. Uh, but very pleasant. I actually like this, this one quite a bit. I will uh, keep an eye out for these and hopefully get to enjoy another one one day. Anyway, I thought I would, uh, as usual, wrap up with a quotation, uh, this time from Arnold Schwarzenegger. And it's very appropriate. It goes something like this. Milk is for children. When you grow up, you need to drink beer. And on that note, see you guys next week.